In this video lecture, we'll look at the basics of linear feedback and control systems. Control systems are one of the most important applications of linear feedback systems. So let's look at our definition of what a control system is. A control system is an interconnection of components or subsystems that provides a desired system response. In other words, control system uh, is designed to control the output of the system. Each component or subsystem processes, processes its input signal to create an output signal. For example, we're gonna be working with linear time invariant systems. So we have input signals coming in from the left, uh, X, output signals coming out uh, on the right, uh, which we'll call Y typically. Uh, control systems utilize an actuator or controller that influences the process whose output is to be controlled by modifying the inputs to the process or plant as it's sometimes called. So um, this diagram here shows just a, a real basic control system without any feedback at all. But um, the input to the control system here is the what we want. This is the desired output. This is also called the set point. That signal goes into the controller, which sends a signal to the plant or the process to produce the actual output. And this is called the process variable. Now, in a perfect world, of course, this actual output will be exactly what we wanted um, for the um, input set, uh, set point over here. But as we'll see, that's not always the case. So let's look at some more basic features of control systems. The controller and the actuator are usually considered separately. So the controller produces a control signal that tells the actuator what to do to the process to change the output. And the actuator and the process together are called the plant. So here in this diagram, again, we see um, the uh, desired output is what's input into the controller here. So that's our set point. The controller then sends a signal to the actuator that actually um, changes the process over here. So the actuator and the process together um, are called the plant, and this produces the actual output. So we'll be looking at several examples that'll help clarify uh, some of these concepts and definitions here. Our first example um, is a rotating disk speed control. So this has um, a lot of applications. Wherever you need something um, turning, uh, for example, the wheels of an electric car, um, a CD or DVD player, a computer hard drive, uh, in old school vinyl record player, a potter's wheel, uh, even a washing machine, anything like that. So what we have here is this is our rotating disk. So this is um, the speed of this disk is actually our output variable here. And um, the disk is rotated by a DC motor. So the motor here is the actuator, okay? And then um, there is an amplifier here um, that sends a signal to the motor. So that is our controller. And then finally, kind of working backwards, here is our speed setting, which might be um, simply a uh, potentiometer or a variable resistance um, connected to a battery that uh, changes the voltage going into the amplifier. So this, this physical system here um, is represented by the block diagram down here. We have a desired speed or voltage, that's our set point. Um, that goes into the amplifier here, which is our controller. The amplifier then sends uh, vo a voltage signal to the motor, which is the actuator, and the motor then turns uh, the disk, which is our process in this case. And then the um, final speed here of the disk is our output or process variable. Let's look at open loop versus closed loop control systems. So the example we just looked at with the uh, disk speed control is an example of what's called an open loop control system and because it doesn't use feedback. The output depends directly on the input. So we have, you know, again, the set point over here goes into the controller, which sends a signal to the actuator, and then the actuator um, works on the process here to produce an output. A closed loop system, on the other hand, has many advantages over this system up here, mainly automatic control due to self-monitoring. The output is measured via a sensor 
and compared to the input using a feedback loop. The resulting error signal, if any, is used by the controller to tell the actuator how to influence the process. So here's the block diagram of a closed loop control system. So let's take a look and see how this works. So again, we have the desired output or the set point of the system is inputted here. That set point basically then is going to produce uh, a signal for the actuator to tell the process how to behave and, and give us an output. So here is our initial output over here. What happens in this feedback loop is the output is monitored or sensed by some measurement device here. And again, we'll see several examples of how we can do this. But this measures the actual output and brings it back and compares it to our set point, which is what we want. So this comparison or comparator here is comparing our desired output, our set point, to the actual output. And if there's any difference between these two, then we're going to get an error signal. And the error is just the difference between these two signals. That error signal is then sent to the controller, and the controller then will send a signal to the actuator telling the, uh, the plant or the process how to basically adjust, whether to adjust greater or less, depending on the sign of the error here. So you can see that this feedback loop, uh, we basically have automatic control due to self-monitoring. The system is able to monitor, monitor itself by comparing the output of the system to what we want the output to be. So let's go back to our, our rotating disk example and see how we could improve this system using a closed loop negative feedback control system. So we have um, pretty much the same system here. We have a battery and a speed setting over here with this um, variable resistance. And that signal is going to go to an amplifier, which sends a signal to the motor and tells the um, disk how fast to spin. But the difference here is that what we're gonna do is we're going to connect a tachometer which measures the RPMs of the disk. So this is our sensor. The tachometer then is going to send its result back and compare it to what our speed setting was uh, desired to be. And notice this is negative feedback. You can see the minus sign. So we're really looking at the difference between how fast we want it to go here and how fast it's actually going here. And if there's any difference, if in other words, if we have some error, that error is going to go into the amplifier, and that amplifier then is going to tell the motor to either speed up or slow down, depending on the sign of the error. So again, this uh, closed system here um, is going to produce a very accurate speed measurement because it's it's self-monitoring and self-regulating. So down here, you know, you can see the uh, block diagram for the system. We have the input is the desired speed or voltage. That's our set point. Um, that's compared, uh, you know, here's the output here of the process variable, which is the speed. Remember, that's measured by a sensor called a tachometer. Uh, that's compared with the input here. That error signal goes into the controller or the amplifier. That signal is sent to the actuator, which in our case is the motor that turns the disk. And then the motor, of course, drives the rotating disk, which is our process. Let's look at another example of a basic closed loop negative feedback control system, one that you're certainly familiar with. Um, this is the um, example where we're just going to have a car for, for this automobile steering control system. So um, when you're driving your car down the road, and you, um, the road, let's say the road turns a little bit, um, if you didn't do anything, obviously your car would go off the road. So what we're doing here is, um, and you know, when you're driving, you're not really aware of this, but you're constantly making adjustments to the steering wheel, depending on the position of your car on the road. So in this example shown here, we have the desired direction of travel is here straight down the road. But let's say the car starts to veer a little bit over here to the right, well, then we're going to notice that with our eyes. Okay, that's going to be our visual um, sensor here. And we're going to make an adjustment. We're going to turn the wheel um, to correct the position of the car. 
So we can see um, what happens here in this system, um, the desired course of travel, let's say we wanted to go 10 degrees north of east. That was the direction that the, the road was going. So, um, and let's say the car is actually traveling eight degrees north of east, all right? So we would notice that obviously that our car is starting to get a little bit off, off track in the road. So that um, the sensor part here, um, this is our feedback loop from the output um, is our, our sensor in this case is gonna be basically our eyes noticing that the car is not going in the direction we want it to. So then um, our error signal, since we wanna be going 10 degrees north of east, we're only going eight degrees north of east, our error signal is two degrees. So then um, the controller in this system is you, the driver, and you're going to basically send a signal by moving the steering wheel. So the steering mechanism, um, which is the steering wheel and all the uh, uh, steering mechanism that connects to the, the front wheels of the car, that's the actuator of this um, control system. And then uh, the automobile, is the process here. And so uh, by turning the wheel, you're gonna make the correction. And this is, a, you know, notice this feedback loop is continuously happening. It's not just a one-time correction. It's a real-time uh, constant uh, corrections all the time. So the output then, um, this dark line here is the desired direction of travel. So this would be, you know, uh, sort of looking down like a, a map view. This would be the, the, the winding road that you're trying to drive on. And the actual position of travel is hopefully very close to the desired uh, direction so that you don't go off the road. Let's look at the uh, closed loop transfer functions for uh, some of these feedback systems. So now we're gonna start to do some system algebra for these systems. Um, in this, the first uh, examples here, what we're gonna do is uh, something called unity gain negative feedback systems. So what that means is that the output Y is fed back directly without any change in the signal. So that's what we mean by a unity gain. Uh, basically, we are just multiplying the output by one. And um, this is a negative feedback system again. So notice there is a minus sign here. So really we're multiplying it by negative one. Um, doing the system algebra for this is, is pretty straightforward. Um, what happens here is if we start here at the output with Y, we're gonna bring Y back here and notice we have the minus sign. So we're adding negative Y to X, the input. So we get X minus Y. So this is our error signal, because remember X is our set point, what we want the output to be. And so the output, if it's anything different, we have the error X minus Y. That error then goes into the controller here which we're gonna represent with a transfer function called G of S. So then the output of the controller is just G times the error signal, X minus Y. This signal then goes into the plant, which we'll represent with a transfer function called H of S. So then the output of the plant is its input, which is G times quantity X minus Y, multiplied by the transfer function on the plant, which is H. So we get H, G, times quantity X minus Y coming out here and notice that is our output where we've gone all the way around, we're back at our output. So we have an, uh, an equation for our system, which is the output Y is equal to G times H or H times G times X minus Y. So there is our, our systems equation. Now to get the transfer function, we wanna find the output Y divided by the input X. So what we can do here is um, kind of uh, collect and gather terms. Notice on the right side, we have a G, H, and a minus Y. Let's move that over to the left side. And so we get Y by itself, which is represented by the one, plus G times H. And then on the right side, we had a G times H and an X. We'll leave that over there. Um, finally, once we've uh, split up the Y's on the left and the X's on the right, we can find the overall transfer function for this whole system. We're gonna call that Q of S. Uh, we're not calling it because H of S was um, used for our plant here. And we wanna find the overall transfer function for the whole control system, which is Q of S. So Q of S is Y over X. And so from this um, equation here, 
we can just uh, do a little bit of simple algebra and division, and we end up with uh, g of s times h of s on top, and on the bottom we have 1 plus g of s, g of s times h of s. Uh, the example down here is basically the same. Um, the only difference is it's actually simpler. Um, our controller here, we're replacing it with a um, what's called a proportional controller. It just has a simple gain factor of k. There's no um, dependency on frequency or s. So it's just multiplying by some constant, uh, which is called the gain of the controller. And you know the, the algebra proceeds exactly like it did up here. All we have to do is just uh, replace wherever we see g's up here, we replace it with a k. So we end up with our transfer function, uh, q of s is equal to k times h over one plus k times h. Here's another example of a feedback control system. Um, in this case, we have a telescope tracking system. So um, here's our, our telescope here. And um, the idea is we want this telescope to point at a certain position in the sky. And so um, there are different telescope designs, but in this particular one, we have two um, axes of, uh, of rotation. We have an altitude um, right here, an altitude setting, uh, which is basically the elevation or angular elevation of the telescope. And then we have an azimuthal or how it rotates horizontally. So between these two outputs here, we can point the telescope to any position in the sky. Um, so let's uh, let's just take an example here. Let, let's suppose, let's just worry about the um, altitude. So let's suppose this is the control system that just controls the altitude of the telescope. So um, the input again, remember, is our desired position or set point. So let's say we want the telescope to point at an angle of precisely 45 degrees. So um, let's say you know the telescope does its thing and it's only pointing at 44 degrees, okay? So it's off a little bit. So what uh, the telescope has then is a sensor on it. And usually this is some type of optical encoder that can read the angle precisely of where the telescope is actually pointing. So that actual position is sent back here. And remember, this is a negative feedback loop with a minus sign there. And so we produce an error signal of one degree because we wanted 45 degrees and we got 44 degrees. So we have 45 minus 44 gives us an error of one degree. That one degree error signal um, is the input of the controller, which sends a signal to the actuator of the telescope. And in this case, the actuator of the telescope are probably gonna be some type of electric motors that are going to move the telescope. So in this case, the controller is gonna tell the actuator or the motor to move the telescope up one degree, right? That was our error. And so the actuator then um, moves the telescope um, one degree and we end up with 45 degrees over here. And again, if we're off a little bit, let's say we were close like 44.9, well, that's gonna be picked up by the encoder or the sensor and we're gonna get another error signal smaller and it's gonna tell the telescope to nudge just a little bit more. So again, this is a continuous feedback loop here that's going to cause this telescope to um, basically zero in on the desired set point of position. And notice in, in this case, the telescope is what we call the plant. Um, it's the combination of the actuator and the process together, the motors and the, the telescope optical tube assembly, it's called, uh, would be the entire plant here. Let's continue with our telescope tracking system example. And we can now um, come up with a block diagram for um, our, our system here. So this is our control system as we just described it on the previous slide. Uh, what we wanna do now is start to put some math to this. So um, since the sensor is reading the actual position and sending that actual position back you know, to the comparator here, um, we can model that, you know, in a perfect world, that's going to be what we call, again, a unity gain feedback loop here. So we just, we're just going to take the output position and bring it back here and compare it with the desired position. And that's going to give us our error signal, which um, in here I'm calling it 
E of t is our error signal. And of course, our error is just x, the desired position, minus y, which is the actual output position. That signal is going to go into uh, the controller here. So the controller here, I've sort of combined the controller and the actuator together. And we're going to um, assume that this can be modeled by a transfer function called h sub c, where c is for controller. And then that signal, the control signal, basically tells um, the, the telescope how to move. Um, and the telescope uh, would be have a transfer function of h sub t with t for telescope. So here's our, our simplified block diagram that we can now do some system algebra on. So let's go ahead and do the system algebra for our telescope tracking example. So here's the simplified block diagram again from the last slide. And what we can do now is just label some of these signals on the uh, diagram. So we'll take our telescope um, output position Y, and remember we're gonna bring that back here, and it uh, gets negated by the minus sign. So we have X coming in minus the Y here, and that is our error signal, which is x minus y. That becomes the input to the compensator here, um, which is, um, or controller, uh, we can call it either one. Um, that's gonna be hc times this signal, x minus y. Um, and that's also equal to hc times e, since the error signal is x minus y. And finally, that signal goes into the telescope, um, which is um, has a transfer function of h sub t, so we just multiply this input signal coming into the telescope by h of t. So we end up with hc times ht times x minus y, and we're back at the output, so that all equals the output y. So that allows us to immediately write our function or our equation for the system. The output y right here is equal to all of this, which is h sub c times h sub t, times x minus y. Um, what we can do now is um, solve for, uh, we can put all the x's, group all those together. Um, so I'm going to, there's, I skipped a couple steps here of algebra, but basically we can distribute these h's inside the parentheses here, move all the y terms together, uh, move the x term, leave it over on the right side. And when we do the algebra, we saw this um, on a previous, a couple slides ago, um, we have y equals hc ht over 1 plus hc ht all times x. And finally, we can write our system transfer function, which is q of s is equal to the output y divided by the input x. And that's all equal to hc times ht over 1 plus hc ht. Now, for perfect tracking, in other words, if this telescope really is gonna track well, that occurs when the output is exactly equal or tracks what we put in for the input. In other words, we have no error, right? X minus Y is equal to zero. The other way of thinking of that, when X is equal to Y, meaning perfect tracking, then that means our system transfer function should approach unity or one. Now, when does that happen? Well, notice that if hc times ht is a very large number, then this one down here becomes insignificant. And we can basically um, approximate this whole thing as hc times ht over hc times ht, which is of course just one. So perfect tracking is going to occur for a large system gain. And the system gain is the combination of the compensator or the controller here, HC, and the telescope, HT. Those two transfer functions multiply together. When we have a large magnitude, uh, much greater than one, uh, we will have perfect tracking. 